Hello everyone, this is David Everson uh, providing you an extra credit uh, lecture in textual criticism. Textual criticism is something that I'm very interested in. It is something that gets us back to the origins of what we know about the biblical text. Um, and I find great freedom in establishing freedom of thought in establishing what my original principle is uh, in any field of knowledge. And so textual criticism for me is, it's a lot of fun because you sort of know exactly what's going on. And it, for me, it gives me greater confidence in uh, understanding and uh, trusting in the biblical text. Uh, I thought I would share some of the rules for textual criticism, sort of just give you a, a sense for what textual critics get up to, and then also share uh, some more information on the different manuscript families. We talked about the Masoretic text, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and the Septuagint before, and today we'll talk about the Vulgate, the Targums, and the Peshitta. And then that will cover most of your bases for looking at the text. So in terms of the rules, we'll start with the premise, uh, why we need to evaluate, why we need rules. The premise would be we have zero original manuscripts. Right, Jeremiah lived around the time of the Babylonians, you know, with Nebuchadnezzar, and he wrote a book of prophecy, and we call it the book of Jeremiah. We don't have what he wrote. We have copies of what he wrote. And this is true for every ancient text, right? Unless it's chiseled into stone, and of course there's a lot of those inscriptions, uh, you, <laughs> but you don't find uh, biblical authors chiseling things into stone for us, that, and we don't have if they did, we don't have them. So we're, we sort of have to do this. We have to evaluate all of the copies. And this results in, in what uh, folks call an eclectic text. Eclectos in Greek means chosen or called out. And, uh, you know, for the Wesleyans and Calvinists who like to debate, um, you know, this is where we get the word the elect. And so your uh, text is chosen. It's a composite text based upon multiple copies. So what you do is you gather all of the manuscripts that you know for any given biblical book, and you evaluate which one's right whenever you find corruption. Whenever you find a disagreement, you have to pick a winner. Is it, should it be this or should it be that? And um, that's the basic nature of textual criticism. And, uh, some of the rules. I'll just share a few of them, and there's there's others beyond this, but in my mind, these are these are sort of the big three. Uh, the reading that explains all others is preferred, and for all of these, there's Latin phrases that go with them, and this is because textual criticism goes back to the days of Erasmus, uh, a contemporary of Martin Luther. Uh, he is the the father of the Enlightenment. Right? He wanted to go back to the original sources, and so he was interested in evaluating what the original text would have been. So this is, textual criticism is very much an enlightenment kind of thing to do. It's very modern. It's not very postmodern. And so, utrum in alterum abiturum erat, so that which uh, would lead into the other. Um, so the, the reading that explains all others is prefer, preferred. So that's sort of the first rule. If you can sort of map out how the corruption would have happened, then pick the reading that sort of explains that. Um, going from A to B could make sense. Going from B to A wouldn't make sense, sort of a thing. And you might be able to, I'll give you one example and, and maybe it'll be more clear uh, after that. But anyway, that's the big rule. The reading that explains all others is preferred. Uh, the second one is the shorter reading is preferred. So, lectio brevior preferenda est. So, the shorter reading is preferred. And this is the idea that the text expands, the text always grows. I think part of this is the, the, the nature of Scripture or how people view Scripture. Scripture is holy and sacred and they don't want to leave anything out. And so what will happen uh, in one generation, they write a note in the margin. Uh, the next generation that copies that says, oh, this note in the margin, this marginal note, this marginalium, needs to be included in the main text. And so they will squeeze that into the text the next time. 
and then the text expands. And this is why when you look at the so-called uh, textus uh, receptus or receptus, the, the received text for the New Testament that the Greek is based, uh, that the King James is based upon, it's much larger than uh, the NIV or the ESV or the uh, NRSV or any, any modern translation. So modern translations looked at more ancient manuscripts and they found that the texts were slightly shorter, right? So the fruit of the spirit, the King James has an extra fruit of the spirit or two extra or something. Um, and that's because the text tends to expand over time. And for that reason, the shorter reading is preferred. That doesn't mean the shorter re reading is always right, but this is sort of a guideline. Also, the more difficult reading is preferred. Lectio difficilior preferenda est. So people who, tran people who copy translations want to make sense out of the text. And sometimes as time goes on, people lose facility with a language. Languages die. So Hebrew is a language that Moses spoke, but it's also a language that Nehemiah spoke. And those guys lived about a thousand years apart. Well, newsflash, languages change over a thousand years. And then moving on from there. And so people are sometimes confused by the text. They might not understand it as well as the authors did. And so they will try to smooth things over and make it less confusing. And so for this re reason, the more difficult uh, reading is preferred. Okay, so those are just the three basic rules of textual criticism that uh, are the big three. Moving on, so let's take a look at Jonah 1.9. Uh, this is where Jonah is fleeing uh, his call to go to Nineveh because he doesn't like the Assyrians. We'll talk about those guys later. And he goes uh, down to Joppa, gets on a boat, and there's a storm, and they say, Who are you? And his response is, And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. Vayomer alehem, ivri anochi. So in the Hebrew, he says, I'm a Hebrew. Okay, in the Septuagint, which we talked about in a previous lecture, it reads, Kai apen pros autus doulos kuriu ego eimi. And he said to them, I am a servant of the Lord. Totally different texts, right? Um, it, it would be hard to, in English, it would be hard to go from one to the other. And so what's going on? Uh, how could this corruption have occurred? And what's probably going on here is a confusion between the letters uh, Resh and Dalit uh, within the text. And I have the, the letters R and D. And you can see in the PowerPoint here that they're, you know, they, they're, they look like right angles, except one is a little curved and the other has a, a corner, a sharper corner, and the, the bit sort of hangs off. The little bit that hangs off, they call a tittle, right? The little... Um, the little ligature that's hanging off there. So it's a confusion between these two letters and a con and the abbreviation for the tetragrammaton, the name Yahweh, yud heh vav -He in Hebrew. That was often abbreviated with simply uh, just a Yud or a Jot. So we've, in, this, in this text, we've got an issue with a Jot and a Tittle, which is interesting. So in Hebrew, the word for Hebrew is Ivri. And even if you don't know Hebrew, that in the far right there, that's what it looks like. However, the way you would write servant of the Lord in Hebrew would look like that, which is Ebed Adonai. And so you can see the Dalit and the Resh, how they look very similar, and then the abbreviation for Yahweh. So there's really, uh, Ivri, Hebrew and servant of the Lord in Hebrew look very, very similar. And so, you know, the textual critics I know, they prefer the Hebrew. Uh, so the Masoretic text is preferred uh, because it's the shorter reason and it explains how you got to the other. Um, so it's the, uh, okay, so that's just an example. Moving on. Let's take a look at the Latin Vulgate or uh, the Vulgata. So the Latin Vulgate uh, was a translation that was uh, made by Jerome around the year 400. However, prior to Jerome, there were Latin manuscripts, right? So Jerome lived around 400. And um, you might know from your church history that in the West, Christians 
eventually wrote in Latin. So, for example, Tertullian, who lived around the year 200, he wrote in both Greek and Latin, um, and if I'm not mistaken, everything that he wrote that we have that survives is in Latin. So, you know, for a couple hundred years, you've got Latin manuscripts uh, in the West. And they call these the Old Latin or the Vetus Latina, the Vetus Latina. And the Old Latin, the Vetus Latina, was a Latin translation from the Septuagint. And so you've got the Septuagint coming from the Hebrew. So the Latin coming from the Greek is a, a Latin translation from the Greek translation, which comes from the Hebrew. And so you have sort of two steps uh, involved here, going back to what the original would have been. And one of the characteristics of the Vetus Latina is that it, ha it has a lot of corruptions. Uh, that is to say, there's a lot of, if you look at one copy, old Latin copy of Genesis and compare it to another, they are often different. Uh, the church father Augustine, he says that there are as many uh, versions of the old Latin as there are copies. That is to say, every copy of the old Latin was different than every other copy. So it was just, it was full of corruptions. And uh, this is part of the reason that Jerome uh, decided to make a translation from the Hebrew into Latin. This is very unusual because Christians didn't learn Hebrew. And in fact, even after Jerome, they really don't learn Hebrew until the days of Erasmus and Luther, where they want to go back to the original sources. And so Jerome was, uh, he had a keen intellect. He was a very, very uh, intelligent person, in my opinion. And uh, he really follows the example of a church father named Origen, who sought to do something similar with his hexapla. And you can, you can Google that if you want, Origen and the hexapla. But so for Jerome, he wanted to remove one of those steps and sort of go right from the original. And Jerome has this phrase, Hebraica Veritas, or the Hebrew truth. So he thought the Hebrew preserved what was true, and he gave priority to Hebrew over Greek. And this is the reason why Protestants today don't like the Apocrypha, or we don't include them in our scriptures. I mean, I don't have anything against them, but I don't include them in my scriptures. Uh, and I guess I'm following the example of Luther, who followed the example of Jerome. The term Apocrypha, I think I mentioned before, actually comes from Jerome, who viewed it as something questionable. He did translate those Greek uh, intertestamental books into Latin, uh, but he did not view them as uh, being of the same quality and, and status of uh, the Hebrew texts. So Jerome, as the story goes, was invited by uh, uh, Pope Damasus uh, in the late 4th century, in the late 300s, like in 380-something, 383 maybe. He was invited to begin this work. And we just have Jerome's testimony about that. Some people wonder if Jerome might have been telling tales, but, uh, but that's how the story goes. And Jerome begins this process, which was a very long and arduous process. Okay, so the nature of the Vulgate. The Vulgate, in terms of evaluating manuscripts, it basically follows the Masoretic text. You know, every now and then you'll find a reading uh, that deviates. And for that reason, you know, it's useful to check. Uh, but you're not going to find the, the variance from the Hebrew text, the Masoretic text, like you would... Uh, with the Septuagint uh, or with the Dead Sea Scrolls. Jerome was influenced by the Septuagint, especially early on, right? He, he, he was more familiar with Greek. He was classically trained in Rome. And so Greek was uh, a second language to him. And as time goes on, he deviates more and more uh, from Greek. And this is actually something I've, I've published on and I've argued for that Jerome was an excellent translator whose facility with Hebrew improved over time. So I'll go ahead and post uh, an article by yours truly. If you have trouble sleeping, uh, you can uh, read it and see the sort of arguments I get up to. But that's the nature of the Vulgate. Uh, the Vulgate, you should know, becomes the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church. And this was a reaction to Martin Luther translating uh, the Bible into the common language for people to so that everybody could have it. Uh, the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church, uh, and the Council of Trent responded against this and made uh, the Vulgate the official uh, Bible of the Catholic Church. Uh, Vulgata in Latin means uh, for the public, uh, 
So with our word vulgar is related to it, vulgar uh, meaning common. So anyway, it, it was the common, it was the published for the people uh, translation. That's the Vulgate. Here are a couple of interesting passages from this. Uh, the word Lucifer, incidentally, comes from the Latin. So in Hebrew, we have this passage, uh, how you have fallen from the heavens, O bright morning star. And uh, you can see, if you do Hebrew, you see uh, Halel ben Shachar, Shachar there at the end. And this is something that uh, Jerome translates theologically. And uh, of course, Lucifer is related to the Latin word lo looks for light. So it means, uh, you know, resplendent one or bright one. And so it is a, a it's a translation according to sense. Uh, but it's also interpretive. How you have fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. So that's where the word Lucifer comes from. So the word Lucifer sort of sort of is in the Bible, but it's in the Latin Bible. And then this one, uh, Matthew 26, 26, just as a little interesting factoid. Hoc est corpus meum. Uh, this is my body. Incidentally, this is where the phrase hocus pocus comes from. Hocus corpus becomes hocus pocus. And that's just a little Latin trivia uh, Vulgate trivia. Okay, so uh, that's the Vulgate. Jerome's quite the dude. The Aramaic Targums, uh, Targumin or Targumaya. Uh, targum literally means translation in Aramaic. Uh, the Aramaic Targums may have had their start all the way back in the Persian period. So if you read ne Nehemiah 8, uh, you've got the public reading of scripture, and it talks about the text being read and interpreted uh, for people to understand. You can see that in Nehemiah 8, verse 8. And uh, this is it's the idea that people stopped speaking Hebrew and they began speaking Aramaic. Uh, and so you see this already in the Old Testament in that the book of Ezra is written in Aramaic. And the book of Daniel contains... Uh, it's much of it is written in Aramaic and so there came a point where uh, Israelites or in the Persian period we can say uh, Jews began to speak a different language and if that happens well then you need to have a translation that you understand if you're going to publicly read scripture and eventually you know there's rabbinic testimony about how things should function in the synagogue and the, the problem with this is that rabbinic literature all comes from the year 200 and later most of it much later it's sort of medieval literature really like the talmud for example uh, what would happen according to rabbinic testimony is that the hebrew would be read in the synagogue and then following the hebrew the aramaic would the aramaic translation would be given after that and people think that the aramaic targums that survive uh, that we have come out of the synagogue. They have a, a sort of a religious uh, start to them, which I think that the, that's a fair argument. Uh, the nature of the Targums, uh, the Targums very much follow the Masoretic text closely. So they're sort of a, a descendant of the Masoretic text. They tend to be uh, literal, especially Targums Uncleos and Jonathan. And we'll get to those in just a second. Uh, later on, some of the Targums become much more interpretive. For example, the Targum to the Song of Songs, it's difficult to call a Targum. The, or sorry, sorry, it's difficult to call it a translation. You will have, uh, the, the Hebrew might be translated, um, one line of Hebrew, Hebrew will be translated, and then that will be followed by an inserted story that has that's nowhere to be found in the biblical text. And it's basically what you would call rabbinic midrash, where uh, these, these folklore and legendary type material gets inserted into the text. Um, but that's, that's later um, in the, the Targums to the writings. Most of the, most of the uh, translations of the Targums are pretty literal. Uh, the main Pentateuch Targum traditions would be Ankylos, Neophyte, and Pseudo-Jonathan, or Ankylos, the Palestinian Targums, and Targum Pseudo-Jonathan. Uh, Ankylos has its origin maybe in the second or third century, and it comes out of Mesopotamia, 
although you could say it comes from Palestine and Mesopotamia. Some folks feel it had its origin in Palestine. It, it started in Palestine and then sort of moved to Mesopotamia and grew up there. Uh, it, uh, it has a Babylonian vocalization, you could say, which is different than the Masoretic text, which has a Tiberian vocalization. But Onkelos has its origin uh, in the synagogue, uh, as we said before. Targum Neophyti and the Palestinian Targums, they come from a later time period. Neophyti is the most prominent and famous example of the Palestinian Targums. There's the, the so-called Geniza fragments and the fragmentary Targums. Uh, so we have other pieces of the Pentateuch from this manuscript family, but they're not complete. Uh, the Geniza fragments are fragmentary because they've deteriorated and the, the, fra uh, the, uh, the fragmentary Targums are fragmentary by design. Uh, that is, they're just, they just, the translators cho chose to translate certain sections of the Pentateuch, which is probably related to the Jewish reading cycle in Palestine. But anyway, they come from Palestine. Neophyte is the most famous, uh, and this comes out of the synagogue. And when you go from Onkelos to Neophyte down to the last one, Pseudo Jonathan, the texts, the translations become less literal and they become more paraphrastic or interpretive. So Neophyte might insert a little bit of Midrash, a little bit of a story here, a little bit of a longer translation there. And um, that's the Palestinian Targums. By the time you get to Targums Pseudo Jonathan, and I would place Targums Pseudo Jonathan to the days after Muhammad, actually, so it's really a medieval uh, translation. Uh, from the seventh century, it uh, it's very interpretive. Uh, there's sometimes large uh, interpretive sections that are added to it. Um, Pseudo Jonathan sort of has uh, its influence from the east and the west. Uh, some of the language within Targum Pseudo Jonathan is really consistent with the Babylonian Talmud. The Talmud comes from Mesopotamia. Uh, it's the the foundational document within. Uh, modern rabbinic Judaism and uh, I think that this Targum was was influenced by that or sort of grew out of that environment and Targum Pseudo Jonathan probably has its origin in the academy and not in the synagogue there's a number of things within it that would point to um, an academic environment and not a, a religious synagogue environment so anyway those are the just a thumbnail sketch of the three uh, famous Pentateuch translations for the Targums. Uh, also for the Targums, we have the Targums to uh, the Prophets. And so this would be Targum Jonathan. And within Judaism, of course, the Prophets includes Samuel and Kings. Uh, but well, and, and Joshua, Joshua judges Samuel Kings would also be included among, you know, Hanevi'im, the Prophets. So Jonathan would include those books along with, you know, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel and then the minor prophets after that um, and Jonathan is very much it's 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 a sibling to Onkelos they're the same uh, literal translation there's a later uh, prophets tradition called the Tos of Tote which translate uh, more paraphrastically and these are very similar to Targum Suda Jonathan so they would also come from that later time period Okay, and then the Targums to the writings. These come from a very late period. Uh, I mentioned before, uh, Targum to Song of Songs or Shir Hasharim, as they say in Hebrew. Uh, it's very late, and these are much more uh, interpretive. Okay, so that's just a thumbnail sketch of the tar Targums. Uh, some people say Targumim. I like to say Targums. Uh, let's just look at a verse here together, Genesis 18.2. Then he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, three men were standing by him. That's the Hebrew, the Masoretic text. Here's Targum Onkelos. Then he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, three men were standing by him. It's uh, The English is exactly the same. And if you go sort of word for word comparing the Hebrew and Onkelos's Aramaic, they're also very much the same. Uh, Neophyte deviates a bit. Then he lifted up his eyes, and behold, three angels in the likeness of men were standing standing by him uh, here we have 
the, the three visitors that come and speak with Abraham, which are often interpreted to be uh, angels. And Neophyte makes it clear that this isn't just three men, it's three angels in the likeness of men. So there we have a small insertion into the text. Targum to Jonathan, um, I'm just giving you the first part of Genesis 18.2 in Pseudo-Jonathan because the expansion goes much, much farther. Then he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, three angels in the image of men were standing before him, being sent for the need of three things. For it is not possible for a ministering angel to be sent for more than one thing. And this is a, an idea, a rule for angels within rabbinic literature that angels are sent for one task. And this is the passage within rabbinic literature. So if you look at a text called Genesis Rabbah or the Babylonian Talmud, they will point to this passage that the angels came to do three things. And uh, three angels were sent. So therefore, one angel per thing. And this is a rule. And uh, Pseudo-Jonathan in this passage goes on to describe what those things are. So anyway, you can sort of see how the fish grows bigger, how the, the translation expands over time chronologically from Ankylos to Neophyte to Pseudo-Jonathan. Okay, so that's those are the targums. Uh, the Syriac Peshitta, uh, the, the Syriac language is an Eastern dialect of Aramaic. Uh, it comes out of, well, Syria and Mesopotamia, sort of uh, Northern Mesopotamia and Syria. The, the Syriac language uh, is a Christian language. Syriac in its origin, if you look at the very earliest uh, inscriptions that survive, um, it's not always Christian, uh, but eventually Syriac uh, is a language for Christianity. It's, uh, the Syrians have a massive corpus of literature. Uh, I've heard some people say that the Syriac corpus of literature is as large as the Latin corpus of literature which is enormous. If you go to perseus-tufts.edu or org or whatever, uh, you will see that, you know, the Latin authors wrote a ton, you know, over hundreds of years. And it's the same thing with Syriac Christianity. They have a very long history. And of course, Christian speaking Aramaic, this goes back to the days of Jesus, right? The, the Aramaic of Jesus is sometimes quoted in the New Testament. Like when Jesus, Jesus says, little girl, get up, they transliterate Talitha Kumi, Right, Talitha meaning little girl and Kumi being the feminine imperative to stand up. Anywho, Christian speaking Aramaic has a continuous history back to the days of Jesus and there are Christians in the Middle East today who still speak uh, Aramaic. And up until you know the, uh, the, uh, the invasion of uh, Iraq under Bush, you had Christians in Mesopotamia. Uh, I think as I hear now, many of them have been uh, chased away from there. But anyway, it's it's a huge it's a huge corpus. Uh, the translation. Some people argue that the translation of the Old Testament Peshitta began as a Jewish enterprise, but it finished as a Christian one. That is to say, uh, Syriac speaking people, uh, the community that produced that produced the Peshitta, when they started their translation. Uh, project they were Jewish but the community over time became Christian as Christianity spread uh, although that is debated of course all of these things are debated and I'm happy to point you to uh, summaries of, of the debates and of course the summaries can take you to the finer points of the debate uh, but anyway it's a Christian it's a Christian translation uh, it was preserved by Christians uh, it was probably produced by Christians uh, in its final stages the nature of the text, it follows the Masoretic text very closely. So the Targums, the Vulgate, and the Peshitta all closely align themselves to the Masoretic text. Uh, there are some connections to the Septuagint and to the Targums. Uh, that is to say, sometimes people think this the Peshitta was influenced by the Septuagint. Syriac and Greek have a long history of interacting with each other. Uh, Aristotle uh, was preserved in Greek and then he ended up in Arabic. I'm not sure if you've heard of uh, Aristotle being preserved in Arabic, but it's, a, it's an important piece of history. Before it ended up in Arabic, it went through Syriac. Um, uh, like the works of Josephus, uh, there's a, a Syriac 
uh, translation of that. There's Syriac translations of the, of the New Testament, right? So the Greeks and the Syrians were neighbors. And so there's this long history of going from Greek into Syriac. So sometimes so people will argue that this Peshitta is influenced by the Septuagint. Uh, other people say that some of the Targums were influenced by the Peshitta, which it's, they're both Aramaic. They're both the, from the Aramaic language. They're just simply different dialects, right? Palestinian versus uh, an Eastern dialect. Okay, the Syria. So I'll just share a couple of passages. Here we have a bit of theology making its way into the Peshitta. In Genesis 20:13, the text reads, the gods made me wander from my house. Right. Although in English translations, this is often translated in the singular. Of course, Elohim in Hebrew means gods or God, but here the verb clearly in the Hebrew is a plural, hit u, um, and not a singular verb. In the Peshitta, this is changed to the, uh, to the singular, God brought me from my father's house. And there you can see you've got a singular verb um, going with a singular Allah instead of Elohim. Okay, so that's just one example, uh, sort of an interpretive translation. And then here in Genesis 49, 20, where uh, Joseph is, is blessing his sons, he says that Issachar is a strong donkey. And that, of course, could be a compliment, you know, just like dog in, in Semitic languages is not necessarily an insult, like Caleb means dog, right? Dogs are ferocious. It's like calling somebody wolf. Um, but in the Peshitta, they changed that to Issachar is a mighty man. Okay, so that's the Peshitta. Uh, what you have here is a sketch of the history of the Hebrew text. Uh, if, you, if you really want to know. And this is debated and people don't, people look at the history of the text differently than this today. What you see here. This is from a guy named um, Talmon, uh, who contribute, he made a contribution to the Cambridge History, History of the Bible, which uh, I forget what year that came out, but you can find it on page 195. I just scanned it in out of my copy. If you look at the top, you see H with a star by it, and that's, as you look down at the key, that's the postulated proto-Hebrew text of the Bible. So the original Hebrew text as it, as it would have existed in the Persian period. So, of course, that's where the story of the Old Testament ends, is the Persian period. So, moving from the end of the Old Testament story, what did the text look like? And Talmon sees it splitting into different locations, Babylon, or Babylonia, I should say, Palestine, and Egypt. Right, so the bet, so the, these are three different text types. And this theory really comes from a guy named Frank Moore Cross from Harvard, and Emmanuel Tove and others have sort of picked apart his tripartite textual development. So people don't exactly see it this way. But I think this chart is very useful because it sort of maps out the different texts that are out there uh, and their time periods and their relationship to each other. So I think this is still useful. And it could be right. Maybe Tove's wrong and Cross was right and Talmon has it right on. So moving from uh, the top, it's like a tree, right? A tree that's uh, sort of growing downward into its roots, although it's growing upward into its branches. So we should flip it around if we want to go with a tree metaphor. Anyway, the Hebrew uh, moves to the east into Babylon, and this becomes the basis for the Masoretic text, right? So the Masoretic, Masoretic text is viewed as a, as a, as a Babylonian uh, text type. And of course, the Masoretic text uh, Comes from comes out of rabbinic Judaism. Rabbinic Judaism uh, grows up in uh, Mesopotamia, right? It's the Babylonian Talmud. That that's the one that wins, not the Palestinian Talmud, which is a thing. The Babylonians, uh, Babylonia is where rabbinic Judaism grew up, and so that's where he places uh, the Proto-Masoretic text. Okay, and so as you follow that line down. Um, you see it branches into TP and TJ, two versions of the Targums, uh, the Palestinian Targum type. And I guess the Targum, Targum Jonathan to the prophets, he places way back there in the, in the before Christ time period. Yeah, it's interesting. This is, if, if you look at, notice that, that it's BC and AD, before Christ and after death. Of course, 
Sher Yahu Talmon was, uh, you know, a, a Jewish man from Israel, and yet it was sort of standard back in the day to use BC and AD, um, although that that's changed since. Uh, I had a Jewish professor at Hebrew Union who was a he was a classicist. You know, he went to Ar Oxford, and he just he he used BC and AD. He thought the the modern thing was sort of silly. Um, okay, so going back to the very top, going down from the Hebrew, you have the Palestinian text type. And this is basically referring to uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch. So you may or may not know this, but there is uh, a Samaritan, uh, as in like the Good Samaritan or the Samaritan woman at the well, there's a Samaritan text type uh, that you can, you can find in Hebrew. It's very much very much the same as the Hebrew text, but it's just for the Pentateuch. Okay, so the Samaritan Pentateuch, he places there, you know, in the second century BC, and then you have the so-called uh, Samaritan Greek translation down in the, uh, the AD time period. Okay, and then uh, moving down from looking back to the very top, moving all the way to the left, you have the Greek text type, and this leads us to, of course, the, the Septuagint. And uh, the Septuagint itself breaks into different recensions, and you have uh, you have uh, you well just moving from left to right, you've got the Lucianic text type, uh, the, the Proto-Lucianic, which then breaks into uh, uh, the the Origins Hexapla and uh, the Luci the Lucian text type as. As, as it appears in uh, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, I assume I said that's what the B and the S are for, and then all the way uh, to the left, don't the, the uh, Hesychius or Hesychius uh, recension of the Lucianic text type. Don't don't worry about that. Just realize that after the Greek translation came out, it was it was revised and corrected towards the Masoretic text, and that's what these uh, revisions are. Okay, uh, the Septuagint moving down uh, towards the middle became the basis for the Vetus Latina, as we talked about earlier. Uh, uh, Sim uh, Symmachus and Theodotion are two other revisions of the Greek text that move it closer to the Masoretic text. And then the the Theodotion's recension as well. Okay, so the Greek text, the Greek text type you can see is sort of a mess. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the the solid lines indicate direct descent, and the dotted lines indicate influence, and there you have it on a page. I'm sure they gave you a headache, but uh, it's something you can sort of look at and think through, and maybe it makes more sense. Uh, but now, you, anyway, you have something to work with. Uh, and if you're interested in this stuff, I'd, I'd be happy to point you towards uh, other resources. Just send me an email. Okay, so, so what? So what use is this information? Well, we can better understand and evaluate the biblical text, right? Like, what is the text? What are we reading? And there are footnotes at the bottom of your page, and I think just as people who work within the church uh, and are seeking to spread God's kingdom, it's good to know what we're reading. And it's also good to be informed if there's a debate around what, what the text says. Um, not so you can win the debate, but so you can be useful to your, your community. So it's just it's good to be informed about the biblical text. Also, you know, I'm I'm often amazed at the long history uh, of people preserving and taking care of the text, right? And we're the heirs of that. We have benefited from that. Uh, the countless hours and, and, and tedious work that Jews and Christians have done over the centuries in preserving this text, it's really remarkable. And it's really a testimony to the wonder of Scripture. Like, why are people doing this, expending all of this energy? Because the text was meaningful to them, and hopefully it's meaningful to you too. So, you know, there's a long history of Jews and Christians revering and preserving this text. They went to remarkable lengths to safeguard the text and make it available to their communities. And then also there's this idea of translation as interpretation or translation is interpretation. And if you look at the, the Vulgate or the, the Greek text or the Targums or the Peshitta, you won't have to read them long before you see interpretive decisions being made. And English translations have to do this too, right? And when, when you're evaluating the text, uh, there may come a point where you sort of have to decide what 
what's the best translation here in your theology will play a role. So we can better understand the history of Jewish and Christian thought by examining these ancient translations. Um, so anyway, that's uh, that's it. That's the the extra credit information on textual criticism. Have a great week, everybody.